for the last lecture, I wanted to go beyond this DGLAP formalism that we've been using so far, because I told you that this comes from making the calculations in log Q squared from the dominant diagrams, but it's not the only diagram that there is. But to introduce this, a little bit of history. Before we actually had the HERA data, right, most of the predictions that we had for what was going to happen in HERA data were actually wrong. Right? And OK, if you can look at this, right, this is the F2 structure function as a function of x. And you can see there in blue and in green the data that we had so far, which only extended down to about x of 0.1. Right? And here are some of the old predictions as to what might happen as you went to low x, right? Completely flattening, rising, and so on. Actually, this one called GRV91 that rises was not popular. All the other theoreticians thought that these guys were crazy. Like, why, why did they think it was going to do that? Well, just look at what it did do, right? There's the HERA data. It really goes up steeply, more steeply than anybody had ever in, you know, envisaged that it might. Right? And from F2, from its rate of scaling violation, or df2 by d log q squared, if you like, you deduce the gluon. Before we had these data, this sort of pale gray band was there, a deduction of the gluon. They were thinking it would kind of flatten out. This is what this early data said it would do. The gluon would rise extremely steeply, as we saw already in some of the plots I gave you of the gluon distribution in the last lecture. Right? Now, the question really is, why did anybody think it was going to flatten out? Because if you take QCD seriously, that's not what it says. The QCD actually says that it will rise extremely fast. But nobody believed that. Right? And there are reasons why, and that is to do with the fact that nobody thought that this DGLAP formalism would continue to work in, in the low x region. They thought it would need extending with taking into account other diagrams. And to be honest, we still, we're still not sure why it works so damn well in kinematic regions where it's got no right to work well, really. Anyway, so. Um, let me explain to you why QCD would predict this strong rise. If we look at the gluon evolution equation in terms of its two splitting factors, PGQ and PGG, this PGG1 is twice the color factor over Z. The color factor is 3, so that's 6 over Z, right? It completely dominates. CF is only 4 thirds, right? And it's this part of the equation that starts to dominate. So simplify our lives and take only that term. And you find you've got there an integro differential equation that you could probably solve for yourself, right? And the answer to this integro differential equation is that the gluon will rise as x to the minus some power, where the power itself depends on where you are in x and where you are in q squared. T is a notation that means the log of q squared over lambda squared. Lambda is the QCD lambda. It's completely related to the value of alpha s. We used to, in fact, in the old days when we talked about scaling violation, we didn't talk about the value of alpha s. We talked about the value of lambda QCD. Right? So this power depends upon x and q squared, but can be very steep. I'll see that on the next page. The evolution, then, this is the gluon evolution equation. The evolution of F2 will also become gluon dominated. So the only term that will matter in the F2 is the gluon contribution. And that will also go up steeply, just a little bit less steeply than this one. That's what QCD actually predicts if you take it seriously. Now, let's take a look at that. Right? Here are the measurements. There's, they are flattening off as they used to in the old days and then carrying on up with HERA. And I'm showing them now at three different Q squares, 3.5, 15, and 650. The higher you go in Q squared, the steeper and steeper and steeper F2 gets as a function of x. This is the gluon that's deduced from it. 
at q squared 5, 20, 200. Now, this is just the equations we had on the other page for the gluon evolution, stating that when the gluon dominates, you get this rise as a power x to the minus lambda g, and lambda g in terms of the log of t over t naught, log of 1 by x. t naught relates to q naught squared just as t relates to q, right? It's a measure of where, where the starting scale is. Now, what this is effectively saying is that if you started at t naught with a fairly flat gluon, then after q squared evolution, it would become steep. That's what QCD is saying, that it will eventually become steep once you've had enough q squared evolution. What is a bit surprising about this is that it's already pretty steep at q squared of 3.5 which was not, you know, is not considered to be a high Q squared. Nobody's really surprised if it's really steep at Q squared of 650. But they certainly didn't expect it would already start to be steep so low in Q squared. Essentially, you haven't had enough lever arm in Q squared for evolution to make that happen, and yet it's already there. So I'm now showing you, like, all the data, right? So these are the HERA data on F2 at highish scales, more than 100 GV squared, down to lowish scales, we just saw that 3.51 and 2.7. Now, the fact that this was so steep actually encouraged HERA physicists to say, where does this stop? How low can we go when it's still steep? And actually install another detector in the beam line in order that you could actually C to lower Q squared to see what was happening. So this second sheet here is from that run where you had a detector that could go down to lower Q squared, and it runs from Q squared of 0.3 to 6.5. And here we see it at 6.5, 4.5, 3.5, 2.7, 1.5, still steep. The yellow curves are QCD predictions on it, right? It's only when you start to get really low that the predictions differ from the data, and the data is not steep at really low Q squareds, right? Essentially, you could say it's steep down to more or less Q squared of 1, and then it deviates, right? Q squared of 1 is very low for this to be working, right? I mean, in particular, the value of alpha s for Q squared of 1 is about 0.4, which is hardly really in the perturbative region. Right? It, it's rather high. Right? So this, this is part of pe people feel, felt deeply uncomfortable about this. Right? What's going on here? Why is it working so well when it shouldn't be? Now, that's observational caveat, so an ob observation that makes you feel this is working in a region where it shouldn't be. Right? There was another reason. When you're trying to apply DGAP at low x, let's look at what's actually happening. You have splitting factors, which are leading order, next to leading order, next to next to leading order in alpha s. But what's actually in these functions of x, the splitting factors, there are logs of 1 over x in them. And they feed into the quark distribution in terms of this evolution. So this splitting factor here and the log of q squared means that the size of the additional contributions to the parton distribution as you evolve go as alpha s log q squared log 1 over x. Right? Now, what you do, what you're essentially doing in DGLAP is you're summing up whenever p equals q, so all terms of alpha s log q squared, same power, that's leading order DGLAP. To, when you go to next to leading order, you sum when p is equal to q plus 1, so alpha s 1 power higher, next to next to leading 2 powers higher, and so on. But you actually ignore the fact that there's a log in 1 over x in it. Right? That was actually because you were working at x values above 0.1. You didn't think this log was a big deal, where the logs in q squared were getting very large. But when you go down to low x, this is no longer true. A log of 1 over x can be rather big. So you really should consider also summing the logs where p equals r, or r plus 1, and so on. Right? Now, the, that has actually been done also by Russian physicists. Right? The L in this is the same Lipitov. This is the BFKL resummation. Right? Um, Belitsky, 
Fadin Kuryev Lipitov, right? Oh, Altarelli Parisi, the Italians, who, as I said, historically actually wrote it down later, but had their name on it for at least more than 10 years before we realized that. If you go to Italy, people will still call it the Altarelli Parisi equations, right? So, you know, national loyalty. Okay, anyway, we feel that maybe if you're going to low X, you're not summing all the diagrams that you should be, right? <coughs> what does this mean diagrammatically, right? Well, I drew for you the dominant diagrams, and I said that they're actually ordered in PT going up the ladder and ordered in X going down the ladder. And when you're at low X, you can sum logs in alpha S log Q squared log 1 over X, right? That QCD is doing that. That's what it's doing in that integral differential equation that gives you the steep power, right? But it never sums log 1 over X independently of log Q squared. And perhaps you should, you know, perhaps you should take into account these other logs. If you do, then the result from BFKL at leading order was that the gluon would be steep as x to the minus lambda, where lambda is alpha s by pi color factor log 2. For lowish q squared values, where alpha s is high-ish, 0.25, this is lambda to the 0.5. In other words, it's already steep even at low Q squared. Our problem with DGLAP was that it wasn't really supposed to get steep till high Q squared, but it was already steep at low Q squared. And we look at this and we say, hey, this one is predicting it's steep for us already at low Q squared. So is this what we need? Is this the reason for the steep behavior? Uh, in a completely different language that we may get to, but it's not necessary, the problem is posed as, is there a BFKL Pomeron? But you don't need to worry about that unless you already know about Pomerons and Reggie theory and so on. OK, so admittedly, this is only a leading order result. The next, is this, these calculations are terribly difficult. It took about 20 years between the leading order calculation and the next leading order calculation for this. And the next leading order calculation does mitigate the steepness to some extent. However, you can understand why when BFK and L saw the HERA data, they suddenly said, hey, wait a minute, like, that's what we said. And it's not been seen in the world before. Right? Now, just to try and get some feeling for what all this means, right? I told you about the optical theorem giving us the handbag diagram in the quark parton model, and then how we extended that by QCD by summing over rungs of ladders, right? When we do leading order QCD, it's an ordered gluon ladder. Actually, already at next to leading order, when it's alpha s n log, but log q squared to the n minus 1, you would have one disordered rung. So this one would end there, and that one would end there, let's say. Right? What about completely disordered ladders? Actually, that's what BFKL is, essentially, in terms of these diagrams. It's not ordered in the PT as you go up the ladder anymore, because it only cares about x. It doesn't care about q squared. Right. And not only that, just to be to amuse you, there are other diagrams you could think of. Why do the rungs have to go that way? Couldn't they go this way? Right? Why does the incoming boson have to connect to the same quark at each end? It doesn't, actually. There are other diagrams like this that could get into the calculation of the elastic scattering amplitude, and hence by the optical theorem into the total cross-section. These are, go by the generic name of higher twist diagrams, right, which we haven't so far accounted for. They're often thought to be only important when you're at high x and low q squared. And indeed, that's why they mostly haven't been taken into account, because people make cuts on the x and q squared in order to exclude regions where diagrams like that might happen. 
But once you've got the HERA data and you're going to low X, you can't avoid the disordered gluon ladders and the BFKL. And you can't avoid it at the collider either, because if you remember that kinematic plane we had for the collider, actually quite a lot of the action at the collider is going on at low X. It's not all up at high scale at all. So we do need to know how to treat low X. OK. And there are further problems. I mean, so far, everything I did was still linear. The DGLAP equations and the BFKL equations, they are linear evolution equations, right? How about nonlinear effects? What does that mean? Now, people talk about this mathematically. I only ever found one person who was prepared to write me down a diagram as to what it might mean to be nonlinear, right, in the combination of gluon ladders. Um, that was Dick Roberts, the R in MRST, who drew this. But um, another well-known theorist, Jenya Levin, right, he said, why are you stopping at only combining two gluon ladders, right? Why not combine 64 of them? I'm not entirely sure why he thought 64 was the right number. But what he was essentially saying is, you have no good reason why you're only you know, stopping at the combination of two. So, what does it mean if you've got nonlinear effects? Where does it come from? It comes from the fact you've seen that QCD itself is predicting this extremely steep gluon at low x. That means the gluon density is getting very large. If the gluon density gets large, then it could be that gluons recombining with each other becomes just as important as gluon splitting, which is what we normally call gluon evolution, right? But the recombination effects could be just as important as the evolution effects if you've got high density and gluons are starting to crowd into each other and overlap. So the rate of the combination has to go as the density squared alpha s squared, whereas the evolution just goes as the density alpha s. And you can add in, this is one of the absolutely simplest nonlinear equations called the GLR equation. Um, I know the L in this case is Levin and it's Rishkin. I don't remember who G is, I'm afraid. Um, but anyway, there's your leading term. This would be there with DGLAP. And there is the opposing term depending on the square of the gluon density, which is the recombination term. You could even imagine that this term got as big as this term and there was no more evolution. And that's called gluon saturation. Right? I haven't tried to speak in these lectures, because we don't have so much time, really, in, in general terms about hadron-hadron cross-sections and so on. But there is such a thing as the Frossart bound, if you've ever heard of this. right? And it's a limit on how big a cross-section can ever be. It's a unitarity bound. right? If you're finding densities that get infinitely large, then the cross-sections that come from that, the F2 feeds into the cross-section, right, could in principle become infinitely large. We don't really want that, right? We want to respect the Frossart bound. And having the gluons saturate is one way that you could do that. Now, it's true that today at the collider and for the foreseeable future, we aren't really that near the Frossart bound. But nevertheless, you, you, know, you worry about the fact that this is coming eventually and you've got to do something about it. So, OK, let, let me try and summarize what we've been saying here. Right? There are various reasons why you might worry that the conventional DGLAP equations are inadequate. Right? It was a surprise to see structure functions steep already at pretty low Q squared. Right? Should perturbative QCD even work down at those low Q squareds? There hasn't been enough lever arm for the Q-squared evolution. And yet, the distribution is steep. So this large rise makes us think maybe we should be going in for a, you know, alternative additional evolution with log 1 by x resummation. Right? Or even that we might be wandering into a nonlinear regime. So a way of summarizing all this is this diagram. right? This is in log q squared. This is in log 1 by x. So this way we go to high scale. This way we go to very low x. 
There are deliberately no scales on these axes because people are not agreed as to where the regimes start, right? Nobody will, you know, say for sure this starts at Q squared of five or whatever they, you know. We just say at low Q squared, it's all non-perturbative. Alpha S is large and we can't do much with it. It's also a region where the higher twist diagrams come in most. At high Q squared, but not particularly low X, this DGLAP equation picture works very well. And we've been living with it for more than 30 years. It's extremely successful. It's the basis of all the calculations we do pretty well. But it might not be enough. As you start to go to low X, you might need BFKL resummation. But BFKL doesn't take care of the Q squared part of the evolution. So you actually need to combine the two together. And there have been suggestions as to how to do that as well. And if we get to really low X, we might even go across a critical line into the high density region where you need nonlinear equations. Right? And there's plenty of debate about also the positions of these lines. Some people say the non-perturbative region, actually the, the boundary shouldn't be this shape. It should be going that shape and completely subsuming the BFKL region. In other words, you'll, you won't ever see pure BFKL because the non-perturbative region will have got in first. Others say, no, uh, I don't think that, but I think the high density region comes down lower. And so we will go into the nonlinear region much earlier and so on. There's no agreement. And I mean, this is an active research area. What is really going on when you get outside the regime of DGLAP? Right? Now, so as an experimentalist, right, I ask myself the question, do we really need any of those non-conventional explanations? In the physics, in what we know today, is there anything that tells me I have to have this? I, I feel uncomfortable about QCD working so well down to low scale, but is there really any experimental evidence that something else is there? Well, I actually think there is, but it's a bit subtle, right? If I take, now, I told you, we only really fitted data, and not just we, but most people doing this, fitted data at Q squareds above three and a half, four, or whatever. But you can use your evolution equations to find out what do your predicted partons look like at any scale. Now, here, say up at high scales, 2,200, this is the gluon, that's the C. The gluon is leading the C because essentially it's the gluon that generates the C from the QQ bar splitting, right? This is exactly what we expect. And it's still true at 20 GeV. It's pretty much true at 7 GeV. Now let's go down lower than we normally go. At 2.5 GeV, and remember, you've seen data where the steep gluon was, you know, well, where the, where the F2 was steep. Right? That's because data is just F2. The gluon is a deduced quantity, right? It turns out that if you go down to 2.5, the gluon is, admittedly with large errors, kind of turning over, flattening out a bit. But even more surprising, if you take it down right to Q squared of 1, and remember the data themselves, the F2 at Q squared of 1, was still relatively steep. It, of course, relates to the some of the quarks, the SS here, right? The C quarks. But the gluon that goes with it turns over and goes down and might even be negative within errors. Now, this is frankly a bit weird, right? It's not really what you expect. You brought up on a picture of a gluon generating the C, and yet the very equations that you use are telling you that if you go to low scale, in fact, the C is above the gluon. And the gluon is turning over and even looking possibly negative. Now, OK, so as, you know, that made me feel uncomfortable, right? Talking to theoretical colleagues, they said, well, you've got to remember that the gluon is only a construct, right? It's not a real measurable thing. And I said, yeah, but you know, at some extent, they're supposed to correspond to probability distributions, aren't they? So we think they should be positive. And I said, well, yeah, OK, but you know, you've got to remember that once you've got into next to leading order and next to next to leading order calculations, you've really gone away from the probability density interpretation to some extent. Nevertheless, 
So you look at this and you say, where is this coming from? The F2 itself depends just on the quarks and antiquarks, still going up steep there. But the gluon depends upon the rate of the scaling violation of the F2. Uh, essentially, that comes from the PQG splitting function and the gluon distribution. Now, it's the measurement that, the measurement that is a bit weird is the df2 by d log q squared. That's all we've got. And from it, we're deducing that the gluon is get looking a bit weird. But this might not be true. The gluon could be completely normal looking if the pqg splitting function is actually wrong that, that I am using, right? And indeed, it would be wrong if we needed bfkl evolution or not dglap. This is a dglap splitting function, right? Maybe that's the problem, that you've not got the right theory here, and you are deducing a gluon from it that is strange, because you've not got all the diagrams in that you should have. So people said, OK, fine. We need to measure other gluon-sensitive quantities then, in order that we can tell. Because if we measure something else, not just the scaling violation, the gluon will feed into it in a different way. And if we see a discrepancy between one way and the other way, then it looks as if we needed something new in the theory. Right. Rough idea. Now, OK, so in fact, that negative gluon that you see there is a next to leading order gluon. Let's look at it at q squared of 2. The first thing people thought was, well, maybe we're getting it wrong because we're only working. Sorry. Well, I think it's because all our thoughts about what this means are leading order thoughts, essentially, that we have a measurable structure function that depends just on quark densities and a gluon that depends just on the rate of change of those, of that F2. Right? But if you go in for the, I showed, I think, yesterday some convolution equations, there's rather more to it. So. Um, I mean, I agree with you. I'm uncomfortable to think that it's not some sort of probability density. But if you account for the fact that if you look at what a gluon looks like at leading order next to leading order next to next leading order, in fact, actually, I'm showing it here, right? This for the same data, there's the leading order gluon. It still goes up, right? The next to leading order is this dashed one that comes in here. And the next and next to leading order gluon is this green one with uncertainty bands. The very same data deducing the gluon, how it looks depends on the order. And well, you know, to my mind, it has now, as it goes negative, violated a simple interpretation in terms of a probability density. So, you know. Any, in fact, I put this up to say exactly this. People at first thought, oh, we're only working to next to leading order. Let's go up to next to next leading order, and maybe everything will be fine, you know, and it'll all come right. Actually, the opposite happened. If anything, the next to next leading order glue on is even more negative than the next to leading order one was. Right? If you say, well, all right, I don't care what the glue on is, but I do care what measurable quantities are. The longitudinal structure function FL depends on the gluon. That must be positive. Well, it is positive, but it has rather a peculiar wiggle in it. Now, you can't say that God didn't decide that there was going to be a wiggle in the middle of FL, but you know it, it doesn't seem very intuitively reasonable. Now, here in the red is what um, Roberts, Thorne et al. did, they put in BFKL into their splitting functions and re-deduced the BFL shape. And it looks like this rather than like that. Much more reasonable, right? But is it really convincing? Because it only changes the chi-squares of any of your fits by a little bit. It doesn't look overwhelming like this is really true until, in fact, Late in 7010, right, a new paper appeared which is doing log 1 by x BFKL resummation and applying it to the neural net PDFs. Right? And you may say, 
Why did it take, you know, we've known about this problem now for between 15 and 20 years. Why did it take till 2017 before anybody really did these calculations properly? Right? And the answer is the calculations are hugely difficult. And the, uh, the postdoc who did these calculations, Marco Bonvini, who put them in, he has called his program hell. Right? Of course, he says it stands for high energy leading log resummation. He also says it stands for the three years of hell that he spent attempting to work out how to do this and you know, get it into the formalism. Um, so the first reason is we didn't have the calculation because it's a hard calculation. And the second reason is we didn't have data accurate enough to really say, tell one thing from another until you had the final data from HERA all combined and the, you know, the best data you can get. And that was 2015. Right? So the consequences of this formalism are that, again, um, I'll explain this bit part by part. This is a plot of the chi-squareds for the fits, this axis, against q-squared, or the chi-squared for the fit against x. And the fit with just regular DGLAP at next to next leading order is the blue. And the fit putting in the log 1 by x resummation is the red. You can see that it's a vastly better description in terms of chi-squared. Numerically, it's written up here. There's overall an improvement of 70 points for something like 1,200 data points. The chi-squared was 1446 and fall to 1373. That's beginning to be now a change of chi-squared that is really significant, where you really say, look, this, this just has to be better, right? And what does it do for us? It takes up, these are the measurements. They're measurements of the difference between F2 and y squared over y plus fl. That's what we actually measure coming out of the uh, HERA collider. We had fits that always fitted pretty well the data, but didn't quite fit at this low x end where the data turns over. Why would it turn over? Because the fl structure function right, comes in as negative, And if you've got a reasonable size of fl, the low x means high y, and it turns over. The red fits are from the resummation, and they're much better than the blue fits. And so it has affected the high y, low x turnover and given much better fits. But it also gives a better fit to FL, because these are the data now on FL from the collider, right, from which we deduce the gluon. And the regular NNLO is there, and the NNLO with NLX, sorry, the regular is here in the pink, and adding the resummation is in the green. Now, on that curve, all you can say is it looks better, but not hugely. But if you now just, just look at what we deduce from it, I began what several slides ago by saying what made me feel uncomfortable is that the gluon had dipped below the C. That's what this blue does. These are the conventional calculations, the gluon dipping down here below the C. But if you put in the resummation calculations now and you get your splitting function right, then your gluon carries on going up neatly and is always larger than the C. So this, I think, is at least part of the solution to the problem, that DGLAP simply is not enough, and we need something else now. And we've really only come to this conclusion in the last couple of years that we really do need to take this into account. From the point of view of the collider, since you asked, this is on the edges of the current kinematic region. Right? As we went, to, it's more important for 13 TV than it was for 7 or 8 TV. It's particularly important for LHCB, which probes the outer reaches. So if you want precision results, yes, you do have to feed this in. Now, um, right. So we've seen that DGLAP doesn't work. But if we're at reasonably high Q squared, we, can, we know now how to do BFK cal calculations. We can get that to work. Now let's go down to really low Q squared. So 
rather a long way. I'm now going down into this kind of non-perturbative region. So we're saying, yes, we do need to extend this. The calculation, incidentally, wasn't just BFKL. It was marrying it to DGLAP, so you were going across this part of the plane, doing everything. Right? But now I want to just talk briefly for the end part of the lecture about going down into the non-perturbative region. Right. So what could work down at really low Q squared? Right. Possibly ideas from Reggie theory. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of Reggie theory. Before we all understood QCD and so on, this was part of your standard training as a particle physicist, because it was a way we had to understand hadron-hadron cross-sections. And what it said was, that a cross-section, maybe I'll write it here, it's this. For a hadron on a hadron, let's take a proton on a proton, but can be any hadron on hadron, will depend on the center of mass energy of this process to the alpha minus one, right? Once the center of mass energy is high, where alpha is the intercept of the Reggie trajectory. Now, since if you haven't heard of Reggie, you won't have heard of Reggie trajectories. So what is a Reggie trajectory? If you plot particles you know about, plot their spin on this axis, plot their mass squared on this axis, you will find a curious thing. You get straight lines. So something like the row with a mass, of mass squared of 0.5 and a spin of 1 is here. And then you've got um, higher excited, it's like spin 2 things of the same class, which had names like A2. And it's here. OK. And then the ones with spin 3, which had other names like F and uh, rho prime and so on. Here, they were actually good straight lines, and they come through the axis at around about 0.5, and that is the intercept on the Reggie trajectory. Right. You only use it if the exchange that you're looking for is possible. So if you're going proton to proton, this was, these are very early ideas before we understood anything, right? You can exchange something with no flavor, in principle, right? I'm going to call that thing with no flavor the Pomeron, right? You can also exchange further things with flavor, like rows, omegas, Fs, and so on. When you get into something like pi p scattering, sometimes there are cases where you can only exchange a row Say if this is pi plus and that's pi zero and the target has changed, uh, let's make it neutron, proton, change charge. There were lots of measurements done of this idea which allowed us to determine what was the intercept of these trajectories. Now, this fact, I mean, you don't really need to know about this physics. Right? But let's just look at the virtual boson proton subprocess in deep inelastic scattering. So we're not looking at the whole center of mass. We're looking just at the virtual boson proton subprocess. Its center of mass is often called W squared. And if you work out what it is, right, you'll find that it relates to the it relates to the x value such that if x is small, then W squared is large, right? X and W squared are inverse to each other. You can work that out from the kinematics of the process. So going to low X means you're actually going to a high center of mass in the virtual, pro virtual boson proton subprocess. Right? Therefore, people wondered if the cross section of this subprocess might be determined by Reggie predictions, right? Because we were used to Reggie predictions in the old days as working, at least to give you the total cross-section. 
If so, then the Reggie prediction for this virtual boson proton scattering would be as w squared to the alpha minus 1, where alpha is the intercept of the relevant Reggie trajectory. And that would be the Reggie trajectory of the pomeron, which is a flavorless exchange. And flavorless exchanges came in with an intercept just above 1.08. Now, you might wonder, what particles could there be on a pomeron Reggie trajectory? And the answer is possibly glue balls, right? Anybody heard of glue balls? It's purely gluonic hadronic states. People have been looking for them for years and years, and there are some states which are suspected to be glue ball in nature, right? It's not totally established, but there certainly are some, right? When you think about it, now that we think in terms of QCD, we would know that if it was a rho being exchanged, that's just a QQ bar pair that's being exchanged, essentially. What's this pomeron? It's completely flavorless. Could it be that it's actually two gluons? Or even two gluons with a ladder of gluons between them? Is that really what this flavorless exchange could be? Right. In other words, by understanding gluon exchange, could we understand all this low energy hadron physics that we used to do in the old days? I think possibly yes. But, but for the time being, right, just bear with me on this. <laughs> I'm going somewhere with it. The energy dependence, s to the <coughs> alpha minus 1, right, was true for hadron-hadron cross-sections and even true when you scattered a real photon on a proton. Right? This is what turned out to be true. So people are speculating, could it also be true for a virtual photon on a proton? Right? Well, actually, we know the answer because kinematically, the cross-section for this subprocess, if you're at small x, it can be written like this in terms of f2 over q squared 4 pi squared alpha, the fine structure constant. That, again, can be worked out from all the um, kinematics I've given you earlier in the lectures. But if you really, I would recommend for this reading the book, right, which where it's all fully worked out. Right. So if the cross-section goes as w squared to the alpha minus 1, it implies that the corresponding f2 goes as x to the 1 minus alpha. And we've already said we use x to the minus lambda. So it implies that this intercept of the Reggie trajectory relates to the slope of the f2, which is very close to the slope of the gluon. And that's why when we saw this steep slope, I said, could this be a new type of pomeron? Because the old type of pomeron gives only a gentle rise. x to the minus lambda, where lambda is 0 0.08, is, is a very gentle rise. Now, to understand what's going on, let's take all this data on F2 and use this equation and convert it to what the virtual boson proton subprocess cross section is. So we just take these data, use this equation, and convert it to a cross section. What does it look like? It looks like this. There's the cross section of the virtual boson proton process against its central mass energy w squared, but it's here split into different values of q squared. So right at the top, we have q squared 0. That's a real photon. There have been measurements made of the real photon-proton cross-section. There they are. It's pretty flat, but it follows a curve that would go up very gently as, in fact, 0 0.08, right? the Pomeron intercept minus 1. In fact, I'm putting over here what is the value of lambda for the, the rise of lambda f2. I'm putting it here, and that corresponds, if we remember, minus lambda was 1 minus alpha, right? So lambda is alpha minus 1. For a conventional Reggie trajectory of 0 0.08, we see this being true when q squared is less than 1, right? So these curves here, these data points, are all for q squared of less than 1, and they seem to follow, broadly speaking, the Reggie prediction at lambda 0 0.08. And then you go through some kind of a transition where nobody dares to predict it. These are the Reggie predictions here. Here's where nobody dares to tread. 
and then here are the QCD predictions coming in later. And the QCD predictions get steeper and steeper and steeper, just as we've already seen in F2. That's reflected in this virtual boson proton cross section. So if I then plot what are the um, the slopes of these lines, we see it going up and up and up and up. In some ways, the surprise to us has been not that this happened, but that it happened so early. We were expecting the flatness to extend to rather larger in Q squared and maybe then go up with QCD, but not for it, the rise to begin at Q squared of just less than one. But you can see that it's heading up to lambda of 0.4 or so before the data runs out. People who like the BFKL Pomeron with its slope value of 0.5 are basically saying you've got a transition from this old soft Pomeron to the lambda 0.5 Pomeron and we just haven't quite got there yet. And other people say no, there's you know, no reason to suppose this is going to flatten off at all. It could just carry on forever. Right? We don't know about that because we haven't got data. Anyway, it would seem that possibly one can have a picture of the really low Q squared regime in terms of the, the old-fashioned Reggie physics and that you can marry one to the other. It's just a matter of the slope changing. But we'd like to understand that, like what's the mechanism for this? What's going on here, really? How, how does it change? So I'm nearly at the end now. There's been a lot of work in recent years on what are called dipole models as telling us about this transition from Q squared of zero to high Q squared. Now, what does a dipole mean? It's actually just a QQ bar pair, but it's long lived. So when you're at low X, if you, if you actually work out the kinematics of this, you'll find that the photon that is come, the virtual photon that's coming in to strike the proton you can think of the process as it's splitting to a QQ bar pair. And it's that QQ bar pair called a dipole which does the scattering from the proton. Now, this is just another way of looking at, that doesn't show up very well, does it? I mean, we did have this, actually, in that we had the photon hitting what was actually, in a sense, a QQ bar pair. But I said that that had come from the gluon. Right? What we're doing is thinking of this another way around and saying it's the photon that splits into this, and it's this QQ bar pair that's scattering off the proton. Is it scattering via gluon exchange? In other words, is this, uh, is this shape here for what the interaction's happening, is that actually a multiple gluon ladder exchange? Maybe it is. But People started trying to model this dipole proton cross section. And here's a very simple form. This is called the um, Gollett Bienhoff Wusthoff model. And there have been many more sophisticated models since. But this is the simplest one just to explain the idea. So the idea is that the photon splits to a QQ bar pair, which can be either it transverse dimension very small compared to the overall size of the proton and compared to the distance between the gluons in the proton. Right? These are these pancakes for the proton that actually Andre Staranets had showed you on uh, a few days ago. Right? Or we could have, right? So, okay, the transverse size of the QQ bar pair, right? By the uncertainty principle, if you like, relates to the to one over the scale, right? momentum distance to h bar, but we're not putting in units here. So the size of the dipole transversely is as 1 over q. So this is at high q squared when it's small, and at lowish, no, highish x where the density of the gluons is not large. This is a right picture. We could go to the other extreme where you're at low q squared, and you're also at low x, so you've got very high density gluons, and the size of this is bigger than the distance between the gluons. And the form of the cross-section that Gulliff, Bernat, and Wusthoff proposed was 1 minus e to the minus r squared over 2 r naught x, where r squared is this 
spatial distance between the dipoles. So R over R naught, right, small dipole is large Q squared, large it X. If that's the case, then the cross section, right, the first term of it, will just give us going as R squared, and hence 1 over Q squared. And the F2, I'm writing that relationship again so you can see it, if the cross section is as 1 over Q squared, then the F2 is flat. At the other extreme, if R over R naught is large, that's small Q squared and X, and if this term is small, then this just saturates to the value of the overall cross section. Right? It's the saturation of the dipole cross section. And if that's the case, then we can plot it against Q squared and see that the case where F2 is flat, actually they don't really mean flat, they mean like log Q squared, the usual QCD. That's why I said this is very unsophisticated. It hasn't got the QCD in it. It can be improved to have it. Right? But this is what we normally get at high Q squared, right? small dipoles. This is the QCD region. Then we go to low Q squared. And instead of that, we've got the saturation of this cross section. And you can see it turning over and becoming flat. And this actually is what happens, right? We have the data that shows now. Those data that uh, I showed several slides ago, where here are actually probed all the way down to Q squared values of like 0 0.1, 0 0.2. They're the data in red there that are showing that it actually is flattening out. So it's not that that means this particular dipole model is, ro is right, it means that there is some success in the description of the transition high Q squared to low Q squared from these sort of dipole models. And the last thing is to say, look at the structure of that dipole model there and rewrite the dependence it has. Yes, I, I maybe should just say a little bit more here. The distance between the gluons, which is parameterized by R naught, will be inverse to the gluon density. Right. And the gluon density has this power x to the lambda in it, so you can you know, predict how fast that goes. Now look at the structure of it and write it as exponential minus 1 over tau, where the tau is q squared r naught squared, and then write that distance between gluons in terms of the gluon density here. And tau is just a function of q squared and x. Now, a curious thing happens. This is called geometric scaling, right? If you plot all the data for the virtual boson proton cross section against um, against tau, this combination of q squared and x, and you do it for low x or you do it for high x, you get a very different effect. When you do it at high x, you just get points that go all over the place, right? If you do it at low x, the points seem to be coinciding. What that's suggesting is there's a kind of a new scaling that they actually depend on only one variable. The variable may be a rather complex combination of q squared and x, but there's only one important variable in it, tau. And that is happening at low x, and it suggests that there's a new saturation scale dependent on the gluon density. So and the fact that it depends upon Q squared as well as X just tells us that saturation could be extending to higher Q squared. The lower X you go to, the higher Q squared the saturation is extending to. And I've drawn here schematically the idea that here, these, Q, these points in Q squared are below the saturation scale, so they're already saturated. And here, they're above the saturation scale. Nevertheless, they all lie on the same curve because this dipole model describes a transition. So it's telling us it only works at low x. But at low x, it does seem to describe the low to Q squared to high Q squared transition. And you can even see a kind of a knee in this shape of a difference in slope between the saturated region and the non-saturated region. Now, what does this all mean? Right? It's, this was a simple toy model. 
but people who work very seriously on the nonlinear evolution equations, right? I think the most uh, possibly fruitful approach to this is what's called the color glass condensate. So if you want to know more about it and research what's going on, it, it's the color glass condensate that I think probably gives us the most understanding. They, it turns out that if you base your nonlinear equations on this color glass condensate high density saturation region, you get and I've just put the names there of some of the people who work on it, that it does predict dipole forms of roughly this kind, right? So that some understanding of where this is coming from comes from quite heavy theory. And ultimately, what's going on here, right? Right now, as I said, it's only on the edges of the kinematic region for the collider, right? But we're also doing things now like measuring high energy uh, neutrino cross sections. High energy neutrino cross sections, say in the ice cube experiment, in the Auger experiment at, in South America. What happens to the neutrino cross section at high energy depends very strongly on low x. And there will be very significant consequences for where these high energy neutrino cross sections go according to whether or not we're working out theory in this region right or not. Right? There are also consequences for the heavy iron data from RIC, which Andre had referred to, for when you look at diffractive data, and even possibly, as I said, some understanding of that old soft hadronic physics we all used to work on 40 years ago, coming from this kind of picture that actually the Pomeron was multiple gluon exchanges and that if we can calculate that in the high density regime, we may finally understand all this stuff. So that's where I wanted to stop, just to tell you there is much more beyond the regular QCD we use, but it's not all fully worked out yet. This is a research area where people are trying to work out what's the right picture, but we seem to make it, be making some bits of progress. So that's actually all I wanted to say in the pedagogical lectures. Done. Uh, Ah, you again. Hello. Uh, as somebody who doesn't understand much about lattice QCD, but I've heard that it can be used to, to explain some non perturbative uh, aspects of QCD, why can't you deal with it in this problem? Well, lattice QCD is very hard. It takes an awful lot of computing power, and they have now. I mean, how long has it been going? Since the 80s, I think. They have now made really striking progress in that they can start, to, they can predict quite well what the masses of the mesons are and the masses of some of the lower baryons. They're now getting that right, right? But these are calculations for a single output. The output is a mass, right? Now, if you want to, say, predict a parton distribution or these kind of distributions, you have to be able to predict it over a you know, a distribution over a large kinematic region, they simply haven't yet developed the firepower. But in terms of not so much of this, but of the parton distributions, they are now getting somewhere. They have got some plots and some regions which are beginning to look roughly right. But by roughly right, I mean they're still, oh, they're in the right order of magnitude, but they're still up to sort of 50% off what we know the parton distributions have to be to describe the data, right? I mean, after all, it's the data in the end which decides whether you've got it right or not. I mean, I hope, though it may not happen in my lifetime, that we would have a time when the lattice QCD would predict all this and we could simply use it and not be in any doubt about anything. But they themselves say that that's at least 10 years off. And the trouble is they've been telling me it was 10 years off over the course of the last 30 years. Uh, I mean, they have. You know, life is very long. And so, yes, I have seen progress in this. They have you know, got an awful lot more things right than they used to have, but they're still not quite there yet. So, yeah. Thank you.